Swamiji leaves the best reading for the last. This is reading number 52. So the last Sunday every month, we finally get to the sort of the crux of the matter. Because every conversation with someone who is holding a strong, what you might call orthodox Christian, point of view against um, what we might call the self-realizationist point of view, always says, what about this passage? I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. No one can come unto the Father except through me. It seems pretty clear in black and white, in plain English, even though it didn't start out in English. By now it's in plain English. And, you know, if you're with us, you're with us. And if you're not, well, I'm really sorry for you, but we won't be in heaven together. And that's just the way the story goes. And it's not as if um, in the position that I'm in, I have been any less exact in, in making declarations. And I make declarations in a similar manner well, in Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramhansa Yogananda says, in Swami Kriyananda's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, Swami Kriyananda says, and I'm not declaring because I'm incapable of declaring from my own realization that I know this to be true. Paramhansa Yogananda, who um, was a self-realized master himself, who was in, in this, his state of consciousness, was the same as Christ. Kriyananda tells a story in his autobiography, The Path, I mean, there's a lot of names here, but this is anyway, this is a story that Kriyananda told us. And uh, Yogananda um, received a letter from someone. This was when Yogananda was living in Boston. He died in 1952, and this was um, in the 30s, I think. And he had been speaking um, emphatically and publicly about the greatness of Christ and the importance of the teachings of the New Testament and the unity between the teachings of Christ and the teachings of Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita, that was his mission to the West. And he received an anonymous letter from someone. He says, how dare you talk about Jesus Christ as if he were so important? Don't you know that Jesus was just a myth? And the letter was unsigned. It came from somewhere in the city of Boston. Well, Paramahansa Yogananda was able to manifest those signs which the Bible speaks of. This is how ye shall know a true prophet, a, a a true son of God, and it lists out among them omniscience, omnipotence, the ability to know the thoughts of others, to transcend all limiting conditions. So Yogananda went to the Boston Library, and he saw a man sitting by a window, and he walked over to the man, and he said, um, why did you write me that letter? And the man, of course, was just totally startled, because if he'd written it anonymously, and here this man had found him, and uh, he, he, he just flustered and didn't know what to say because he'd been found out in the most compelling manner. And Yogananda said, the same power that enabled me to find you allows me to declare with absolute certainty that Jesus lived and that he was everything the Bible claims him to be. Now, when a person can manifest that kind of power, then we have to sit up and take notice. Of course, one's faith in such a person has to come out of your own intuition and your own experience. It's not enough to read it somewhere and then claim it. There has to be some intuitive connection. Very often with people here, someone not too long ago came to me and told me all the things that I often say that are extremely disconcerting to that person and how they like lots about Ananda, but not everything. And I said, well, as long as you like anything, that's all that matters. Swami Kriyananda once said there was this man who uh, created an argument with him. Swami Kriyananda is the founder of our community. He's an American man, despite his Indian name. And uh, there was this man in our community who was a very feisty fellow. And he was always disputing what Swami Kriyananda said. But he disputed in a very sincere manner. He was, he was curmudgeonly, but sincere. And uh, after one of his particular encounters, when he left, Swamiji said, oh, he said, I prefer an honest argument, he said, over a mindless yes every time. And that's always been the watchword here. An honest argument is better than an insincere desire to be like everyone else. Or what you imagine everyone else to be. Oh, it goes on and on. But the point here that I was trying to make is, here we are. And at some point, many things have to be taken on faith. Even the story I just told you, did it even happen? What did he really mean? All these different things. We're so cynical this age that authority, the mere fact that authority is presented is sometimes enough for us to say, oh yeah, just like that. But nonetheless, at a certain point in our spiritual life, 
we simply recognize that our minds are not enough to tell us everything. And a certain receptivity, at least to the possibility of being able to be taught, begins to set in. People are often concerned, I have to find a guru, I have to find a guru, I have to find a teacher. We say to them, first become a disciple. Because you won't even recognize your teacher unless you have the heart of a disciple. And the heart of a disciple is, is simply humility, is the realization that I'm working it out the best I can, but I'm always running up against myself. And so at least it behooves me to listen with an open mind to the possibility of someone teaching me something I don't already know. So we come back to this statement in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if we have accepted in our hearts that the Bible speaks the truth, if we have accepted in our hearts that Jesus is there to speak to us, it's a very confusing passage. The only possible way to understand it, as Swami Kriyananda recommends, is to step back and see the whole picture. And in fact, one of the reasons that Paramahansa Yogananda came to the West to teach from the New Testament, which he was sent by Babaji and Jesus to show the unity, as I said, between the teachings of Krishna and the teachings of Christ, was because in a sense it was time for someone outside the system to come in. Someone who brings to this whole discussion the perspective of self-realization as expressed from the Bhagavad Gita. Because there's a very simple difference between the way Christianity is presented and the teachings of self-realization. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says that I have incarnated, I, the infinite spirit, have incarnated again and again. That each time divine takes form, the full power of the spirit is present through that human body, acting through that individual consciousness. But as one of my Christian friends said to me, she said, I'm completely devoted to Jesus, but I don't believe that revelation began or ended with Jesus Christ. So it makes him everything that the Bible says he is, but not everything that the church has subsequently claimed, that no one came before and no one could possibly come after. And in fact, when the Christian missionaries went to India and saw how similar the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita were to many of the teachings of Christ, they declared that the dating was somehow wrong and Krishna must have lived after Jesus. It was just like reason follows feeling. It just had to be, you know, it couldn't be, so it had to be. Instead of seeing the more obvious thing that who did Jesus refer to when he used the pronoun I. The entire understanding of the Bible rests on that single thought. And all of us, at least subconsciously, if intellectually we're fighting against it, at least subconsciously, when I say I, I mean this body. I mean this thing that was born and this thing that will die, this thing that has a name and a personality and a gender and all these experiences. This is who I think I am. I act in defense of it. I act with a commitment to it. And even though the whole process of the spiritual path really is to expand one's sense of I, still there's still this egoic involvement. But what the, the Indian teachings explain to us and what the truth of self-realization is, that it's possible to transcend that ego connection completely. And so one still is a bubble in the ocean. Uh, the chant we were singing at the beginning, I am the bubble, make me the sea. That we still are the bubble, but we realize that even the bubble just exists in the entire ocean. And when the edges of our consciousness have been merged with the greater whole, then when we say I, to what are we referring? And Jesus said often, I and my Father are one. He didn't mean that, you know, we're just partners in this enterprise. He actually meant that his consciousness had been completely dissolved. What he called the Father was the power of the infinite. So when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light, the mistake that we make is that we think he meant that body that was born and died. And we, didn't, we don't understand that he had to be speaking because of the way he manifested in his life. He had to be speaking about a power that far transcended that. And yes, that is the only truth. And he was positing that infinite against this ever-changing world. Are we dependent in his lifetime? It was the, the priesthood, the declaration of the priests about what they could and couldn't do, the culture, the comfort of money, the material success, the uh, love of our friends. Who is my father? Who is my 
Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Jesus said. Except he who loves God, even transcending the family. He said, I come not to bring peace. I come to bring a sword to turn the son against his father and the daughter-in-law against her mother. You know, it's, it's not a pretty picture. And we've just kind of like taken a lot of that stuff and put it in a box and, and really believed that Jesus was in favor of family values. But that's not what he said. He said, I am the way and the only I there is is the infinite within us. And sometimes God wills that we live in the comfortable environment of things essentially as they are. And sometimes, as Jesus' life showed the way he walked, he stood for the truth even at the cost of his own life. He perfectly exemplified the way. He perfectly exemplified the truth and the light. But it was what came through him that is singular, not he himself. Because when we expose ourselves as we can now to so many other cultures and so many other teachings, we find the same truth again and again and again and again presented. Because there is only one truth. The Jews had it also, the Jews' fundamental prayer. Hear, O Israel, hear the people of Israel, the people who call themselves Jews. The Lord is one. There is only one reality. And that's what Jesus declared. And we can be devoted <clears throat> to that truth through whatever channel God sends us. But in just the same way that when one has one child and loves that child, one doesn't declare that no other children exist, that no other child is lovable. If you have one husband, it doesn't mean that there's only one honorable man in the universe. It simply means that this one is the one to whom I am devoted. This is the one karmically, intuitively, um, to whom I am bonded. But it doesn't mean that no others could possibly exist. You know, but the principle there of loyalty, of dedication, of single-minded attunement is exactly what's taught in all true teachings. But it's the fanaticism of it and the incredible, well, I can only say lack of imagination that is the stumbling block that in this age we must just turn our backs on. Swamiji also draws a very interesting analogy in his deeper commentary on this passage, which is related to our, our Christmas cycle, so I wanted to bring this up. He says, you know, standing back from this whole story, he talks first about the story of Christmas, which is what we just went through. And on Christmas Eve, some of you were here, and I was talking about this, this relationship of uh, the mother to the baby and, and what sweet, spontaneous love that brings out. Well, Swamiji was talk, talks about how the, the image of Jesus in the manger, of being that tiny baby, brings out of all of us a certain tenderness, as he puts it, and also a kind of protective desire. You know, a baby is helpless. I, I have a, when I was in my 20s, one of my friends had two children, uh, a toddler and then a babe in arms, and uh, you know, she became a single mother, as happens, and I often assisted her in um, helping with her family. And once we, we went grocery shopping, and I, I have never had children, we went grocery shopping, and I was helping her bring everything in. So I brought all the bags of groceries in, and I just set them down. Then I walked off to do something else, and then I brought the baby in like this. And there was this very strong inclination to set him down like a bag of groceries and walk away, <laughs> you know. And my um, support and compassion for her position was great, but it became greater when I realized, what am I going to do with this baby? You know, there was just nothing to do with this baby except just keep him there and continue to take care of him. He was completely helpless. I've heard that sometimes they try to educate teenage girls, especially when they're trying to encourage them not to get pregnant too young, by giving them a raw egg to take care of. And they have to take care of the raw egg 24 hours a day to just give them even the slightest hint of what it is to have a baby. You know, you can't just leave the, in the, the egg, you know, couldn't get too cold, couldn't get too warm, all the different things. Didn't have to be fed, but they had to not break it. All the things that, that are um, even just the beginning touch of that, that child. But also, of course, I had no desire to abandon the baby, except just kind of in a wild imaginative moment, because the baby also calls out of us a protective instinct, doesn't it? It is so helpless and just there it is waiting for us. And Swamiji was saying this is an intuitive understanding in regard to the baby Jesus. 
Because what that's representing is the birth of divine consciousness within us. And you see, when that divine consciousness begins to be born, we have to be very protective of it. We can't just sort of set it on the counter like a bag of groceries and expect it to sort of not rot while we ignore it. We have to be very solicitous of all those impulses. Isn't that so? The first divine awakening, if we ignore that, if we take it for granted, if we become cavalier about it, oh, I used to be very regular in going to satsang, but now I just don't go anymore. And then what happens? It just begins to atrophy. That baby intuition does not flourish unless we give it very tender care. And so the baby being born, the Christ child being born, is the divinity being born within us. But now, even as now that the baby is there, we also have exactly going on in our minds somewhere the picture of Jesus being crucified and resurrected and standing up against all that opposition and with his divine power conquering all of that. This year on our Christmas altar, we had this this beautiful little Italian, we have this little Italian Jesus that we got in Rome, this beautiful little heart, heart center little baby. And we also had this huge picture that is an artist's rendition, supposedly from the Shroud of Turin, but it's that really powerful face of Christ. So we had the little baby and then this huge face of Christ behind him. So we were the whole time thinking of both realities. Now, when we see Jesus crucified, we don't sort of go up to and say, oh, little baby Jesus. You know, it's not this bloody image and this enormous force with the crown of thorns and, you know, the artists just play it to the end. I was with Swami Kriyananda in Florence and we went to the Uffizi, which is a wonderful museum and art museum. And we, we, we mostly saw the religious art. But at the end of it, after as we'd seen maybe, I don't know, a hundred versions of Jesus being crucified, Swami sort of folded his arms in his way and he said, it's time for a new theme. You know, we've just about done it. And in the Festival of Light, that's what it says. Whereas in the past, suffering and sorrow were the coin of man's redemption. For us now, that payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. That's why Master brought self-realization. He teaches from the Bible, but what he emphasizes is the joy, the bliss, the transcendence, not the agony that comes sometimes before you can transcend. But when we get to Jesus on the cross, we're not protecting him anymore. We're begging him to protect us, aren't we? Because what he's showing us is the intense challenge that life brings us and that the the necessity to grow that baby into the powerful man, you know, to take the little sapling that had to be protected and make it the mighty oak. It was amazing on Sunday, uh, not Sunday, of course, it was Friday, Christmas Day. At noon, we do a service here every year, and it's essentially for children and families. And so the room is full of a lot of small children with their parents. And I'm the storyteller, and I tell them about the birth of Christ, and then we build this tableau up here. It's a a lovely service, and I I very much enjoy doing it. But when I'm speaking to the audience, I speak to the children. And of course, the children's consciousness and the parents' consciousness is very different. I have to make a choice, but I speak to the children. But it's a, it's a very interesting experience for me because the children are very fresh in all of this, you know, and they're wide open. And I have to explain why Jesus and Mary had to go to Bethlehem, why they got ripped away from their comfortable home, why Jesus was born in a manger, you know, all of these things in such a way that will, will give them strength. So we tell the story of sometimes life challenges us. Things do not always come easily. Sometimes we have to face difficulties. And the little children are, you know, they know already. They're not stupid. They're just short. You know, they've lived before. So they they feel it. But you see, they feel it so differently than their parents. And so I I watch these two realities. And you can see this really fresh-faced little child. And usually the parents are just doting on the little child. But you see in the parents' face the signs of the struggle. You see, this is the the, the Christ child being born, then the necessary trials, the crucifixion, before the transcendence. Now, Swamiji then says, if we only had the baby, our feelings would never rise beyond what he calls sentiment. You know, oh, the little baby. How sweet the spiritual life is. 
we just sort of go around. Somebody gave me the phrase, which I think is an old one, but I'd never heard it before. Just being little bliss bunnies is what they're called. You know, just kind of all like this, where we just love the spiritual path and everything is so nice, you know, and then the first sign of trials, we're just, that's it. We just go back to doing something else. (laughs) Because unless you have the power that is represented by the end of Jesus' life, that's the promise of that sweetness will never fulfill itself. But if you only have the power without the sweetness of the devotion, then you become this hard edge fanatic. You know, just recently, some poor man, you know, tried to blow up an airplane with something strapped to his shin. I mean, in crazy world we live in. You know, but you can see if, you're a, if you've been imbued with the sweet devotion of the protective inner consciousness of a child, You can't go on an airplane and just try to kill everybody. It's only when you have just this fanaticism without the sweetness that that would happen. Even to to declare to others, you'll go to hell because you don't accept my way of of loving, you you don't have the baby. But if you just have the baby at the first sign of adversity, you fold up because I came on the spiritual path because everything was supposed to be nice and now it's not nice, so there must not be any God after all which is a kind of logic I've heard more often than you would think like that. So all of this is what Jesus is telling us. And more than most teachers, his teaching is his life. How he lived shows us how to live. His teachings explain it, but really it's he himself as he lived it. And it is true that for a tremendous long period of time, he's been the only example for large parts of the world. Because even the saints, um, those who he may have even re- become self-realized themselves, have all been under the um, umbrella of the institutions, and it's been a little hard for them to edge their way up to be equal. You know, it just can't be done. That's just not part of the dogma, whatever the truth of the matter is. So the only example has been Jesus. So when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the light, well, you look around, he sure seems to be, doesn't he? You know, Jude, the Jews no longer remember God realization. He, uh, Hinduism remembers it, but Hinduism has been way off on the other side for a long time. But now it's all creeping together. And the glory of it is, we can have the magnificence of Christ just as he's presented. And it's only, as my uh, Episcopal priest, Kriyabon friend said, who continued to be a priest even after he got on this path, he said, it's just one word of four letters, O-N-L-Y, that's all. He said, everything else is absolutely true, but even the word only is true if you think of it as the truth that he personified. Now, I just have one last little thing to share with you before I end here. On Christmas night, a group of us, uh, just to relax at the end of all of this, we watched a documentary film. It's called The Unmistaken Child. And it was a film made in uh, Nepal and India about a Tibetan Buddhist monk the tradition of the Tibetan Buddhists, of their lamas, is that they, when the lama dies, he often reincarnates somewhere nearby, and they go find him as a child. It seems to be always in male bodies now. You find him in a child, and then they bring him back to the monastery, even at a very young age. The Dalai Lama is considered to be the 14th reincarnation of the same soul, who dies and then is found as a child and is brought back to the monastery and then grows up to be the lama again. It's a very consistent um, teaching. It's not exactly the way our self-realization path works, but it's very consistent with that. So this is the story about this young monk, a very attractive young monk, whose lama dies at the age of 84, and then, without telling you all the details, it becomes his responsibility to go find the, the reincarnation. And through various of their systems, astrologically and so on, he gets some clues. I think he's born in this area. I think his father's name begins with A. And then we watch this monk, this documentary filmmaker, followed him around. It took him five years. And then they find the the reincarnated soul. But the part of it that I want to speak of now, which was amazing, is that this young monk had come to his guru, that, that lama, when he was like three years old. And he'd grown up with that monk, and then he'd been his personal attendant for like 20-some years. So now he goes back, and he finds his guru, and his guru is two years old. So he suddenly 
is still the personal attendant of his guru, but his guru is a baby. And so you're watching this, and he was a beautiful monk, you're watching this amazing reality of him now having to love his guru as a mother. And, and because we've talked often about that being one of the classical bobs, that we love God as a mother loves a child, which is a little hard for the West to get their mind around, except through Mary, but it's one of the ways in which love is expressed. So first he'd served his guru as a child in reverence to this elder wise man, and now he has to express the same selfless love by taking care of this baby. He carries him around, he puts him to bed, he has to feed him. And, and the, you can see the monk himself is like, um, he has total faith in his master, he has total faith in the system, and they call it unmistaken because the signs that who this boy was were just unmistakable. I mean, it really did seem to be the right child, and he manifests all the right energies, but he's two years old. And I've had such a, a wonderful time just... This is, this is how I want to put it. In the, um, in the story of Jesus at the Last Supper, Jesus comes in and he wraps a towel around his waist and he kneels at the feet of each of his disciples and he puts a basin of water and he starts washing their feet. Now, you know, if you put yourself really there, um, Swami Kriyananda is not Jesus Christ, but he's a very advanced soul and we have a great deal of reverence for him. And he comes in and we treat him in a very respectful manner. Just imagine if he takes off his formal robe and wrapped a towel around his waist and he calls for a basin of water and starts walking around to each one of us and starts washing our feet. It's, a, it's just a little hard to, to, to relax enough to really accept that. So Peter, who is one of Jesus' very own, Peter said, Lord, I simply can't allow you to do this. And then Jesus answers him and he says, if you do not let me wash your feet in this way, you are no disciple of mine. And Peter answers beautifully. He says, well, then not only my feet, Lord, but my hands and my head too. But what's being said there is the disciple is not in charge. The guru is in charge. And even the little bit of holding back, oh, this is appropriate. This is what I must do. This is how things must be. We have to go where that divine light leads us. I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. Unless you let me wash your feet, unless you allow the Spirit to come into you as it's going to come in, you're not a real disciple. So here this Buddhist monk, who is completely lost, he says, he says in the film, I never made any decisions in my life. My, my, my Lama just told me what to do and I did it. And I just trusted completely. And you can see it. It worked beautifully for him. He just shines. And now what his Lama has asked him to do is to be the adult to the child. But you see, the heart has to be so free. The heart has to be so free that wherever the way takes us, we just enter into it without any regard for self. Isn't it thrilling? Isn't it subtle? Isn't it exquisitely beautiful? Isn't it just the grandest adventure that you can imagine? You know, one year is ending, another year is beginning. Let us, as much as we can, just wipe away every preconception we have and let that spirit be born within us.